Hello, and welcome to the Global Journalism Seminar Series at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. I'm Mira Salva, and this week I'm really honored to have with us today Jacqueline Charles, Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald. Firstly, thank you, Jacqueline, for joining us at an incredibly busy week. We know you're, you have a huge amount on your plate, and, and we'll come to that in a moment. But also, Jacqueline is a Pulitzer Prize winning finalist and winner of the Maria Moore's Cabot Prize and an Emmy for her work as a foreign correspondent covering Haiti and the English speaking Caribbean. Haiti, in particular, is one of the most challenging countries to cover in journalism. This year alone, the island has been hit by viol ongoing violent protests over the ending of fuel subsidies, a spike in gang and a spike in gang violence, and also dealing with the ongoing effects of cholera, COVID, earthquakes, and hurricanes. In July, the president was assassinated. In August, another 7.2 magnitude earthquake hit the island. And yet Jacqueline's reporting always reminds the readers that the, to, that the news coming out of Haiti is not about disasters happening in a foreign land, but a story of people like us facing adversity and who have lives and stories to tell themselves. Jacqueline is a melting pot of Caribbean influences herself, born in the English-speaking Turks and Caicos Islands and raised in Miami's Overtown by her Haitian mother and Cuban-American stepfather. She really does look into, get, into who gets to tell the stories of others and how they are told. Jacqueline, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment? I know you're in Miami, but you've been whizzing around the region. <laughs> I have been. So, um, you know, I, I cover actually like 20 some countries um, out of the region. So I just um, am putting the finishing touches on a story that I reported in August, believe it or not, um, because of the whole situation in Haiti. I, I was in Barbados with the head of U.S. Southern Command, that's the U.S. military um, command that's responsible for this region, um, the Western Hemisphere. And so I was invited to go on an in-bed with him. I was the only journalist, and he's actually wrapping up his tour of duty um, after almost three years, and he's going to be headed into retirement. And so he really, you know, has become sort of like the face of the U.S. government in a region that he, you know, feels very abandoned. Um, that is increasingly seeing competition from China and Russia. And it was a story I was excited about writing. And then the earthquake happened in Haiti and in a series of one, you know, calamity after the other. So I just finished up that story because he leaves on Friday. And then uh, today I'm actually working on a story that actually gave me some pause and I had to think about it. So over the week, as you know, there's 17 um, missionaries that have been kidnapped in Haiti. They are associated with the US base, an Ohio based um, charity called Christian Aid Ministries. 16 of them are Americans, and one of them is Canadian. In the group are five children, the youngest of whom is eight months old. And they are being held by a gang that's asking for a $17 million US ransom. Um, it's been over a week, they, they are still being held. And while this was going on, you know, there's an ongoing fuel crisis in the country and everything has basically come to a halt. But another gang member um, who runs, who basically reigns over one of the poorest slums in Haiti and one of the more notorious kidnapping layers, he, he released a rap song. And in this rap song, he basically is accusing the government of arming the gangs and now wanting to take the guns back. And basically also saying that, you know, if you see that they don't have hospitals in their communities, it's, it's the fault of the government. Um, at the same time, you know, he issues threats that says, you know, if the police wanted to come and get the assault rifles from them, uh, they would have to kill them. You know, so I kind of struggle in a sense because, you know, about how much publicity do you give these guys? Uh, because a lot of them are really sort of, you know, I mean, they love the press. And, and, and they want that press. But um, at the same time, you know, I, you know, the song says a lot about sort of where the place is at the moment. And then I see that there is also some sort of, you know, correlation between the gangs in Haiti and the gangs, for instance, in Jamaica, while the gangs in Jamaica are not into kidnapping, you know, they have over the years, you know, emerged themselves as political forces in that country. They paint themselves as modern day, you know, saviors of the streets. And so I wanted to you know for our readers who are from this region, 
I wanted to draw that parallel. So that's a story that I'm working on, but it's a story that, you know, ethically, I just had to, for my, my value sense, I, I had to reach a level of comfortability, you know, with it. So sometimes as a journalist, you see the story and it's obvious, but you're also, you, you want to be careful that you're not promoting type of narrative or you're not, you know, sort of feeding into, um, you know, this trap that's being, you know, set up for you. I mean, this is a, this is what I was going to ask you about. You've jumped straight in. Um, can you talk a bit about your kind of, you know, how your thinking on this has evolved? Have there been times you've worked on kidnapping stories in the past, both out of Miami as well as Haiti, and thought looking back, I would have done things differently. You know, it's interesting when the story about the U.S. missionaries broke. I actually was on a rare vacation. I mean, I was I've been forced to take time off. I think I have like three months of unused you know, um, vacation and comp days. And, um, and it was a Sunday and I was actually at a family event and I saw the text messages coming in on WhatsApp telling me about this. But for those of us who, who cover Haiti on a consistent basis, myself, mm-hmm. um, my friend Amélie Baron, who with AFP, you know, Evan Stano, um, who is, you know, with AP, you know, we are very reluctant to, to write about people who are kidnapped and who are still being held, you know? Yeah. First of all, we, we, we live in the country, we're attached to the country, we're not parachuting in. Um, you know, we understand that, that these gang members, they read everything that's, that's written about them, they're on social media, and you really don't want your story to be that story that's the decider any other way. So I actually was like, you know what? Let's just just wait and see how this plays out. And then um, one of those papers that don't normally <laughs> cover Haiti, you know, wrote, it was a New York Times, basically put a piece out uh, with no quotes, but just quoting unnamed, you know, security forces. And it was interesting because when I called the police, the police actually, actually had no confirmation mm-hmm. whatsoever of, of, of this kidnapping, which was not unusual uh, because a lot of kidnappings in Haiti just go I'm reported, but you know, I had other sources that, yeah, that ended up confirming that this was true, what have you. So we were sort of propelled into the story because of the media coverage, as opposed to what we would normally sometimes do, which is either you wait for the person release or you wait until your your approach. So last week I did a story about the fact that there was a Haitian American pastor who lived in Miami, but he's a co-founder of a church in Port-au-Prince. Um, and he was also being held by another gang and he was in captivity for over three weeks and nobody was talking about his case outside of the Haitian media in Haiti. And his case caused not a ripple. And it's like, here's everybody talking about um, these missionaries, these, these Americans, but nobody is talking about this other American. Now, when I talk to people, everybody, you know, under their breath, off the record, you know, like, you know, are basically saying, hey, you know, this is racism. This is because we're talking about white folks who are being kidnapped and not black people. There's different systems, but nobody really wanted to go on the record, you know, and say that. So, you know, in your story, your story ends up being very nuanced. And I think that people can sort of read between the lines in terms of how differently this, this looks. But he was kidnapped with, with three, two other individuals. One of them was released and the other one was still being held with him. And I knew who the second person was, but because I had not touch bases with the family of the other individual that family also had not gone public I decided not to use his name in the story and not to put his name out there some in the Haitian press had done it but I talked to my editor and I said listen we're going to use the name of the pastor because his wife had basically put out a video she you know she went public um, with this um, and I think we're and I'm comfortable with that but because this other individual his family had not done that and I didn't really have a way to reach them. I, you know, I didn't do it. I, I mentioned it yesterday mm-hmm. in a story because they were finally released um, on Monday night. So yeah, so you struggle. So with these things, you, I think you have to approach it very carefully knowing the situation. I mean, how much do you think of your readers as um, the people inside Haiti or the people inside Miami? Like who are you writing for? Oh my for? God, I'm right. You know, that's the one of rules in journalism, right? You have to know who you're writing for, yeah. who's your audience. 
and for me, my audience varies and, 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 and it's very complex. And so that adds to the challenge of me approaching a story. My editor complains sometimes that my stories are so long, but I tell him, I said, well, look, first of all, it's complicated. Second of all, often it should be two stories and not one. And I'm, you know, and I'm trying to do, you know, two stories in one to give it the context. Yeah. And then third, my readers, my readers are people in Haiti yeah. who, um, you know, often think they know what's going on. Let's just say, okay, in general, my readers are Haitians who think they know what's happening, but they don't know. Okay. Then you have readers in Haiti. And then you have Haitian readers outside of Haiti. And then I have an American audience or non-Haitian audience that either works for the country, work in the country as, as, you know, aid workers or something, um, or they, you know, they're just, you know, interested in Haiti. And then, of course, you have this diplomatic community that's always trying to figure out, you know, what's the driving engine? You know, what is it that they're missing and they're not seeing? So whenever I'm approaching a story, that is what I have to think about. And then sometimes, you know, I'm, re- I'm thinking about, you know, last year. Um, so this is the 11th year since the anniversary of the earthquake. Mm-hmm. And I started working with stories last year that came out in January, which day with the earthquake anniversary. And one of those stories was a profile of former President Bill Clinton, who basically had gotten a lot of criticism um, very, you know, unfair criticism and negative narrative out there about his foundation um, and, and, and things. And so when I, I remember going to an editor um, who works with me about how to approach the story, because I didn't want to write for Haitians. I didn't want to write for people who were in Haiti. I wanted to write for an American audience that knew this guy as a former president um, who's now retired, has an affection for a country, but has gotten this sort of bad rap. Yeah. So when I approached that story, I approached that story from that angle, this angle of, you know, sort of here's Bill Clinton in this sort of wider world and then bring it down to him. So, and, and, and that was intentional to draw in, you know, new readers, new audience. I mean, the, the Miami Herald itself has kind of quite a hard paywall. It's, you know, with a limited number of free articles. The but it's, you know, it's, they're very determined that people should pay for the journalism. How does that square with your um, with your circle of, audio, of readers, really, especially well, the ones inside Haiti? Well, exactly. So, you know, so it's interesting, you know, for us at the Miami Herald, Haiti, Cuba, Venezuela, these are local, these are local beats for us. We don't consider them to be foreign beats, right? Even though we are foreign reporters writing about foreign places. Um, I'm, I'm one of the few that actually can travel, you know, um, on my beat, but, you know, our Cuba reporter, for instance, we can't go to Cuba. Um, I mean, we have in the past and we find ways to do it, but it's very difficult. So, for audience in Cuba and Venezuela, we basically had that paywall down. So okay. those readers were able to have the paywall. But for the longest time, Haiti still had a paywall. And it, and you're right, the, the paywall is three free stories every 30 days. And I remember when they changed that, I was just like shocked. And I was also kind of upset because I, I said, look, my audience you know, report, you know, I supposedly cover the poorest country in the hemisphere, right? And we're asking people to pay. And yet we, there's a, there's a glitch in our system that we don't accept the the credit cards and Haiti doesn't have PayPal. So again, you know, if we're, you know, looking at matrix and we've got this thing where it measures how many people are clicking on your stories. um, I mean, you know, how am I supposed to deal with that? So one, let me just say, that despite the paywall, the stories actually do do well. Um, you'd be amazed at the number of, of, of audiences outside of Haiti that are reading those stories. Um, but our new executive editor, Monica Richardson, who came over from um, Atlanta um, Journal, it was one of the first issues I raised with her. And I said, look, I would like for us to remove this paywall for people who are signing on in Haiti. Um, but, you know, with, with the story, I think that they should have access from time to time. You know, I will, we will translate stories in French when we're, you know, in certain projects that I feel that are important. 
We did a COVID project last year about Haitians dying of COVID at a higher rate, but Haitians in Miami. And so she did that. So today there is not a paywall if you are signing on to my stories in Haiti. Okay. And have you noticed that uh, a kind of difference in feedback and reactions you get from readers in Haiti? How long has that been down? It's been it's been over over the summer, but you know what happens in Haiti, you know, and, and this is where, you know, my my community of fellow journalists have been very helpful. Um, you know, reporters, when we write stories, you know, like the Haitian press, like, you know, my, my boss will say something like, oh, it's too late to put this story out. I said, no, it's not. I said, my, my stories will do well at eight o'clock at night because the news cycle in Haiti starts at 5 a.m. in the morning. And at eight o'clock at night, people are preparing for that morning news cycle. So they read the stories over the radio. They will, they will quote the stories. Yesterday, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. We did a story about the kidnapping out of Washington. The National Security Advisor says that they were giving significant resources. Oh my God, the story basically went viral um, minutes after we posted the story. And everybody's been sending me this story, especially out of Haiti, because people are now reading all kinds of things into it. And this morning, it's like a leading talk item on the radio. Okay. So it, it, you're, you're kind of making noise. That's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how, um, let me just ask a little bit about the political outlook in Haiti at the moment. I mean, how how is Ariel Henry being received as the interim prime minister? And, you know, the elections aren't going to be happening on the 7th of November, but do you feel that they will happen in the new year? And if so, how are you going to frame this journalistically? So this is a difficult situation. Ariel Henry, Dr. Henry is in a very difficult situation because he, you know, he went into a government, um, even though he is not a member of the governing party, Piastika, that has been, you know, the narrative and the image and the labeling that has been put to him. And he's been having a very difficult time forming some sort of a consensus government because yeah. people that he's, he's approached who are people that you will probably want to be in a government have said, oh no, I don't want to be part of that government. So President Jovenel Moise is dead, but the problems that, you know, that shadowed his three years um, and four years actually as president of Haiti, they remain. And so, you know, today we have a situation where, you know, there is not a drop of gas, fuel um, at any of the pumps. Hospitals are running low. They've already warned that people are going to start dying because they can't even, you know, they run on generators. Um, When you think about COVID patients, there there was already an oxygen crisis to begin with, and now it's even worse. And, you know, yesterday the police um, tried to get some of the fuel trucks in, but the gangs basically block, um, you know, uh, block the port. You know, those of us who cover Haiti closely, you know, we're looking at this and we feel that this is, you know, this prime minister is being squeezed and it's not by accident and that there may be some other, you know, hands behind the curtain, you know, that are sort of doing some orchestrating. But, you know, as a reporter, you you you, you have that gut instinct, you see it, but you, you need the proof, right? Mm-hmm. And it, you can't write it until you actually have that. But, um, but, but you see the number of things that are coming on. And at the same time, there's no elections this year. Um, Henri will like to take the country to two elections. I don't know. I, I don't think he's going to have that opportunity, even if he remains in office, because there's really a push on a part of civil society groups to basically put a two-year stop, a transition. But again, when I look at what's happening, it begs the question, can Haiti sustain two years without a functioning government? a country that is really dependent on the international community that, you know, is not comfortable giving money or financial support to a government that's not elected. And when you look at the insecurity, the rampant kidnappings, um, a weak police force, you know, you know, that's why everybody's sort of looking to the, to the U.S. But the problem is, is that, you know, the voices coming out of Haiti has been very critical about the U.S. policy toward Haiti. And what they don't realize is they now put the U.S. in a very difficult position because now, Anything that the U.S. does is going to be read a certain kind of way. So in a past where maybe the U.S. or the international community community may have been fast reacting, um, things are taking time. And and I think the U.S. policy still is not completely clear in in, in respect to Haiti. So the politics are messy and confusing at this moment. I mean, as a journalist, you normally look for where the power is and then try to examine what's going on with the people hold power. And it's a question from um, Aina Dalapo, who is a Nigerian journalist um, in, based in Rwanda, who's asking who controls the machinery of state in Haiti? So would it be, you know, if you're trying to kind of really write about what's going on, 
where would you look first? Would you look at the government? Would you look at the gangs? Would you look at NGOs or would you look at US policy? Yeah. Or, or... I, think, I, I think today who controls what's going on in Haiti is an invisible hand um, that we know it, but we have to try to find the evidence to, to prove it, to show it. And I think people who follow Haitian politics are, are, are very much aware of it, but unfortunately the, 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 the face, the public face is there is is this um, interim prime minister right that all things all buck starts with the government everything sort of falls on you you know when people want to come in and negotiate they're not going to go to the invisible hand um they're going to go to the person that they see but it's a lesson though i have to tell you a uh, former u.s ambassador years ago one of the things the first lesson and it's been one of the most important lessons that he's taught me about haiti is what you see is it always is you and I could both be looking at a car coming down the street. I ask you what color it is. You say it's white. I say it's red. We're both wrong and we're both right. That, that's just the way how the country works. You know, if it perception often becomes reality, um, Haitians don't believe in perception for themselves, but they believe in it for everything else. And things are never black and white. So where does this leave the idea of journalism as reporting truth or being impartial or objective? Um, and especially in Haiti, where you've got reporters like yourself operating regularly and traveling regularly to the region, and then the big organizations parachuting in, you, it's kind of hard to get a sense of. Well, exactly, right? So some people could think that because we're consistently covering and we have sacred cows, and it's like, no, you don't have sacred cows. You just know that while you know somebody that's parachuting in may go to something or, or, or go to a particular person or issue with thinking that it's very black and white, but those of us that are there know that, that it isn't. And, and in covering that story that may be more complex and more nuanced, what we're doing is that we are looking and, and, and so your stories end up being very nuanced. You are telling the truth, you are telling the facts, you're reporting the facts, but after times, you know, my stories too are very nuanced. <laughs> you know, if, 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 you know, after the Haitian president, um assassination you know the question that everybody was asking was like how many people were were shot outside yeah. of the president how many people and and we knew the wife was injured but we didn't know about whether any security people and so you know we didn't have the answer but this was a question that we continue to raise in our stories and sometimes you just have to say what you don't know you know like we don't know this we don't know that so right there that raised the question of, of is there more to this assassination that we you know that we know one of the stories that i did was like the final minutes it was a TikTok on the final minutes of the president's life how he was calling various individuals asking to come and help him to come and save him and nobody and nobody showed up you know that is a story that when you read that story, you read between the lines, you, you end up realizing that, you know, wow, the security forces were not even willing to, to, to take a bullet for him. You know, look at the breakdown of sort of the security. So th that's what makes the reporting in Haiti to very, um, you know, it's, 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 it's like you're walking a, a, a minefield. And I often say that when I step on the landmines, I wanna know the landmines I'm stepping on them and I do it intentionally but I make sure I, I know that they're there. I mean, that is my next question. The question that Decillion Daniels is asking as well. It's about safety. How safe do you feel reporting inside the country and once you leave? And how are other journalists also faring on the ground? Do, you know, are they safe? Are they able to do their job properly? So, you know, this is a difficult time, like right now as I'm speaking to you, you know, with Haiti, because um, there is no safe harbor for journalists. There is no humanitarian corridor. In 2004, as journalists, we could all get together, put, you know, press on the windows of our cars, and we can go into these communities as a convoy and, you know, and go and talk to gang members and they will welcome you. But today, you know, you know, you may end up being the next kidnapping, you know, victim. So you have to take these precautions. You know, weirdly enough, you know, after the assassination of the president, um, things were very calm, right? And that's what it goes. It, it comes in ebbs and flows. So things were calm. We were out, we were reporting, you know, during the earthquake, um, after the earthquake, you know, even though with COVID and everything, we were fine. We were, you know, some of us were getting around on motorcycles and, you know, I actually, I, 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 I went, to Haiti with my bulletproof vest, but I ended up leaving it in Port-au-Prince. Um, 
But, you know, today, I, you know, two weeks ago, I was going to go in just on a personal for, you know, for a funeral. And I actually like, I was, I kept going back and forth, you know, I kept yeah, going back and forth and thinking about it. The first thing you have to know if you're going to go to Haiti is how you're going to get from the airport mm -hmm. to your hotel. That's first and foremost. And then you got to figure out where, where you want your hotel to be. Because if, if you have lower downtown, if, if it's constantly hot or there are issues, you know, perhaps you want to be in Petroville, which is higher, higher up. But, you know, these are the kind of things, strategies that you're thinking in your mind. But this is not a country where you just pop in and you say, oh, I'm just going to take a taxi from the airport to, to, to whomever. You know, it, it requires planning. What happened, you, you made a really interesting point, and I was a foreign correspondent in 2003, 2004, where you could put press on a sign and you would be fine amongst gangs, amongst uh, rebels, you know, amongst militias, and now you're not. What do you think has happened in Haiti in the interim, in the intervening? The, the gangs have become very emboldened. I mean, first of all, after the 2010 election, when we had President Michel Martelly, he basically would publicly um, say that the country it's getting a bad rap because of people like us, because we're the ones who are taking pictures and sending these negative images abroad. And so you literally saw where, you know, for photographers, Haiti was like a photographer's paradise, full of color. People were open, you know, I think between the NGOs taking photos and leading people to believe that their lives were going to change by a photograph. And this, um, you know, rhetoric that the president was putting out there, it became a safety issue for, for journalists. So you would be on the street, trying to take a photo and people would actually come up and, and aggress you. People would, you know, come and threaten you, try to take your camera out of, you know, out of your hands. Um, so sometimes, you know, I would be on and I would say to my driver, okay, you know what, we're, we're just two Haitians going down the streets. You know, we're just, we're just traveling down the street. Um, you have every situation you go in, you have to, you have to assess it. And I think today, you know, there used to be an unwritten rule in Haiti. You don't touch the blanc, you don't touch the white guy, the foreigner. Yeah. Um, and today with this kidnapping of, um, of these Americans and this Canadian, you see that they're no longer any sacred cows. So the, the, the gangs have become more empowered and more emboldened. They feel that they have the backup and that, you know what, they're, no, they're not afraid of the Americans. And, and that has struck a lot of fear, um, you know, in Haitian society, because it's like, wow, if they're not afraid of the Americans. And that means that all of us are at risk. Okay. I mean, going back to the idea of parachute journalism in this context, and um, the question from Tona, a documentary maker from the Netherlands, which is how, when you get the kind of people coming in for the disaster reporting, do you feel that makes it um, more dangerous for, for you guys who are there more regularly? Uh, or does it, does it kind of boost your ability to get your stories in, in your own newsroom? So there's two things, right? So there's definitely um, power in numbers. So if you're on the ground and that there are other reporters um, that are there, you do feel like, okay, it's a larger force of us that are there. Um, and and you there's a sense of sort of safety in numbers, right? Mm -hmm. um, the frustration though that I, you know, and then, so you have these, these mixed feelings. So on the one hand, you know, you've been covering a beat for years, I mean, literally like the past decade, and nobody was paying any, any attention. Um, and you sort of been lonely, you know, out there and, and, and you're doing it. And so all of a sudden, other reporters come, you welcome um, that, but then, you know, they either want to get it, they, the shortcuts, or you feel like you are working for others, whereas, you know, they take your stories, and they basically redo it. You know, there's a certain paper in the United States that we know and that they do this all the time. And I, you know, I found myself blowing up, you know, recently because I said to someone, I mean, I, people think that this is a compliment. It's not a compliment. It actually becomes insulting after a while because as a journalist, it's on a beat. There's enough creative stories for people to do rather than for somebody to basically take a story that you just did two days ago or a day ago or a week ago and basically just recraft that story don't credit your, your news organization and make it seem like it's a new story that they're breaking. I'm happy that people refer to my stories. I'm happy if my stories are inspiring you in some other ways. But to basically just redo the story that I did, you know, with using some of the same sources or the same theme, it's just very, it's very annoying. It is. Do you have any pushback? Do you push back on social media or? <sighs> I did push back, actually. I said to a really 
tourist tweet one day to um, former ambassador who was doing a piece, it was a piece about lobbyists, um, Haiti using lobbyists, the New York Times did a story. And I basically said to, to this former US ambassador, I said, no, you read this story. You read it in the Miami Herald in April. <laughs> Did they respond? You know, I know they didn't respond, but I, you know, it's, it's so it's, it, yeah, I mean, me and my other colleagues, we're having the same, we're, we're, we're going through the same thing. And even like in the case of the local press, you know, sometimes the local press has been using her wire copies of covering a story that's, 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 that's there. So, you know, again, I don't, I, I've had to parachute into places and, and, and journalists on the ground who cover it consistently. Um, have have saved me so many times, you know. But I, I but I remember just doing it once and thinking like, oh my god, is this what it's like for people who parachute into Haiti, right? That you don't have the context, you don't know the background, and then you're going to go do this interview with somebody, and all of a sudden you're turning this person, you know, who's a despot into a hero because <laughs> you're framing, you know, you're walking, you're framing the story how they want you to frame it, and you don't have the, you know, the background to do it. No. Thank you. Can we talk a little bit about um, the reporting in Haiti on two big things that we're looking at, which is COVID um, reporting and climate change and COVID in particular, um, Haiti has been incredibly hard, hard hit and has had very slow vaccine rollouts. Um, what's your sense of what information people are getting about COVID-19? Are you worried about so, this information? So here's what's, you know, so this is probably one of the more difficult stories or stories to get at. But ironically enough, despite the fact that Haiti has less than one percent of its population vaccinated, um, it was the last country in the Americas to receive vaccine. It has not had the death toll or the infection toll that we've seen just even next door with the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. I think the last numbers I saw maybe was six hundred registered death. Keep in mind, yes, you know low testing, um, you know, we, we, we accept that, we acknowledge that, but I was in Haiti during cholera. And when people tell me that 10,000 people died from cholera, I can tell you yes, because I saw the bodies on the streets. Yeah. I saw people running through the towns with people, you know, on the edge of death. You have not had that with COVID. Today, there's 150 people hospitalized with COVID and my boss two days ago was filling in for my regular editor. He says, this number doesn't seem right. It seems low. I said, no, it's right. I said, first of all, hey, you know, you're talking about a country where people don't necessarily believe in COVID, although now they are increasingly realizing, but they call it a fever. They treat it with their home remedies and the hospitals are sort of a last resort. But this is also a country where the average age of the population, I think is like 24 years old. So the, so, so you do have a, a, a COVID problem, but you don't have it, it hasn't, we're not seeing Brazil, the DR or Ecuador play out in Haiti. So I did a story last year about how, you know, scientists were sort of stopped by this and trying to figure out why Haiti is having these sort of low COVID infection rates or you're not seeing the death toll that you've seen elsewhere. We've seen similar stories out of Africa as well, right, yeah. that have come there. Um, and so, but, you know, but then earlier this year, the government got into this whole fight about AstraZeneca and not wanting AstraZeneca. And then they were like backtracking. And that's one of the things I'll tell you that's been difficult, either government officials not wanting to talk to you or just outright lying to you. And that also makes truth gathering difficult for people. Yeah. I tell them, you make my job easy when you don't talk to me, but you should talk to me. So the story could be more balanced and, and, and be fair. But when you straight up lie to me, you really do yourself a disservice and you're really making my job difficult. So we had this whole back and forth um, about the whole issue of the vaccine and them not wanting AstraZeneca. Um, and so we wrote a lot about you know those stories. And at one point people were saying that the Miami Herald was the only one writing that story, you know, just yeah. the vaccine story in Haiti and things. So that is, you know, and, and so we're continuing to watch it. The country right now is in a third or fourth wave. Um, we've lost, you know, a lot of notables, you know, the, the, the head of the, the president of the Supreme Court died like just two weeks before the president was assassinated uh, from COVID related, you know, illnesses. Um, I mean, the deaths have been hard hit, the ones that you know. Okay. I mean, you, th there are so many health stories out of Haiti. There's yeah. the, the cholera epidemic, there's COVID, and then there's all the kind of the lack of treatment, lack of support for cancer, which is what yes. you've written about so powerfully. Um, I don't quite know what the question is beyond, is, is Haiti kind of, is, is part of the 
um, story of COVID in Haiti, the fact that it's just like one of the many things that's going to get you. So it's hard, you know, it's one. No, of the-, the stories evolve. Initially, COVID in Haiti was a story about how people don't trust the government and didn't believe in this disease. Okay. Then the story, um, and so that you saw that first reaction. Then the story of COVID became how the government was weak and couldn't even enforce its own law policies to telling people to wear masks. Yeah. Then it became a story about lockdowns and, and, and how in these informal economies, um, people, you know, can't afford to, to, to lock down or schools can't afford to close. And then it became a story of the haves versus the have nots because people, students who went to schools that had technology, they could stay home and they can do online, but most people did not have that access, right? Yeah. And then the story became that we're not, everybody was waiting for at least 20,000 people to die, minimum, you know? And all of a sudden it was not happening. People were getting COVID, but they were getting over it. They were recovering for it. And that became like the big story. Like why is Haiti not being hard hit? when it's on the same island as the Dominican Republic and they had over 100,000 COVID cases and they had, you know, th- you know, hundreds, initially hundreds, I think now it's over a thousand deaths. Yeah. So that became the story of COVID and then it became a story of vaccines. So the story with COVID in Haiti, it has evolved. And I think that you see, you know, when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, you see Haiti on the extreme end of that. Yeah. When you talk about the lack of access to vaccines, you saw, you saw that, but you also saw pushback from a country that's saying, hey, just because we're poor, it doesn't mean that we should just take whatever vaccine you want to you, you, you want to give us and what have you. And today, the story in Haiti is how, you know, is about the fact that, you know, as well tension as the U.S. And, and the U.N. is with providing vaccines, if you don't provide the money in order to do the outreach, then these vaccines are going to go to waste. Yeah. Yeah, that's the story yeah. we've seen in, in a lot of the world. Thank you. And can I ask you about climate reporting? Because this is something we're starting to look at really in depth at the Reuters Institute, which is how climate change is perceived in different countries and whether sometimes people see see what's going on in front of their eyes in, in the land around them and, and you know attribute this to climate change or environmental degradation. And I remember doing a, a kind of conversation with journalists from from Nigeria and Kenya, who said the problem is there's climate change happening all around us, and yet people will look at us and say, "But it's surely it's about the polar bears." But yeah, so you know, and, and this is one of my weak spots, right? That yeah. I, um, I, you know, I, I'm always running from the disaster, the natural disaster, to the natural disaster. Um, you know, in 2010, I was you know one of the first reporters to fly in. Um, 2008, four back-to-back hurricanes um, in 30 days, you know, I mean, clearly that was climate change, but the stories were not framed that way, right? We literally yeah. was running like, and I think that's, that's, that's one of the challenges is that, um, you know, I'm constantly, I'm like doing dailies and enterprise stories, and sometimes you need the time to just be able to step back and to do that sort of larger story. And that's where the climate change comes in. But I will tell you what, what has made me um, smile and, and brings a little bit of hope is that it is a conversation that's taking place in Haiti, okay. albeit by a small group, but like um, the New Belize, which is the daily newspaper there, they have a radio station, Magic Nine, and they actually have a group of young journalists and they do climate reporting. They actually, it's like set up on like a podcast where they do climate yeah. stuff. I, I, I ran into a young lady a couple of months ago who was working with an NGO and that focus is sort of climate change. So it's like the challenge in Haiti is putting a name to it. You know, why are we seeing these things that it's not just hurricanes because of deforestation? You know, this, yeah. this picture behind me is Likai, which is where the earthquake happened. Um, but I think that that's what we've all done as, as journalists. We've always reported these stories as, oh, it's because the place is deforested, it's prone to mudslides. Um, you know, it's got all of these fault lines in it. But really, you know, what we need to do now is is elevate that to say that this is part of climate change. And, 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 and in countries that you know, sea level rise and all of these other issues, here is why it's even it's deadlier than, than else places. And could you tell me the name of the podcast, podcast please? I will have to send that back to you to get okay. it. I will, I will Thank get you. It you. I really yes. want to listen they, to that. I think won some award recently. I'll, I'll send it to you. Thank you very much. 
Um, a question from Claudia in Guatemala about um, independent media in Haiti. Who would you recommend? And also a question about social media in, in Haiti. You know, what role oh does God. it play in the news ecosystem? So first of all, I will tell you social media. Haiti is like the original social media. We call it Telejol. Like, you know, everything in this country, you know, moves through word of mouth. And that's the other thing that makes it, you have to be very careful, right? Because uh, whether you're talking to somebody in person or you're seeing stuff move on WhatsApp, oftentimes information comes to you as fact when it's fiction or it's being manipulated. You know, this is the home of the original trolls. Like people actually, there's a, I, I mean, I've been targeted at times and I remember putting a tweet out last year and I said, oh, I see the, the factory is busy at work. Um, and, you know, they talked about how I confirmed the arrest of somebody of a, of a prominent Haitian businessman in Miami, no such thing happened. And then I could tell you that four days later, it actually happened. So, so it's not coincidence. So you always have to be very careful. Government doesn't send out, you know, they don't have a website that they put things on. They will, somebody will take a picture of a, of a document, you know, when the prime minister had fired the minister of justice recently, you know, there was a photo of the, of the letter firing him and it signed and then it went out mysteriously on social media. So, wow, you know, okay. so as journalists, you, we have to have our tools for how do you verify to make sure that it's authentic, right? And the same, and the international community operates the same way. You, you get this and now you have to chase it down and figure it out. Um, independent media, I mean, I have to tell you, it's, it's, it's difficult. I love my fellow journalists, but, you know, a lot of these journalists are mouthpieces either for the government or they are mouthpieces for even some of the gangs. Um, you, you have to be very careful um, because of issues, you know, I, I always say to people, I'm, I'm Haitian, I'm a journalist, but I'm not a Haitian journalist. You know, I, I don't collect bribes. I'm not on anybody's payrolls, but people often think if, if, if a person who's in, you know, I had a prime minister who actually understood, you know, the press and he would, you know, good or bad, you know, he'll fight with you about a story, but he would, he was successful. He would talk to you. And then, you know, everybody starts to say, oh, she's on his payroll. She's getting paid because I had access because, you know, so it also makes the job very difficult. I mean, I, I, I go to the Nouvelle East um, because, you know, they do a good job in terms of the reporting, the, the, the facts and the news. Um, in the afternoon, there's Radio Kiskeya if you want to know what's happening during, you know, during the day. But there you also get your commentary. You know, you, you have to know what you're listening to and what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. If, you know, there's Vision um, 2000, that gives you sort of the personality or the news of the day. So, you know, if there's a protest that's happening, I'm turning on to Zenith and I'm turning, you know, onto Pacific live on, on, on Facebook because I know that they're on the street live and they're showing it. There's no one media. You just have to figure out, um, you know, what do you want out of it? And then the information, you get it. You have to basically treat it carefully and you have to like verify and confirm through various sources. Uh, and okay. there's a lot of online media too. Are there times you feel you got it wrong where you were relying on sources that you thought or had been reliable in the past that changed? I had a prime minister lie once that what I wrote wasn't true, but it was true. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, you know, this is the other thing you realize that sometimes you're missing something, right? It's point yeah. of view. So sometimes you're talking to sources and they get the information from one point of view and somebody's got it from a different point of view. And so there's that argument back and forth. Um, you know, maybe I have in the past, I don't know. I mean, what I try to do is, you know, if I have three or more people telling me the same thing and these people are not in the same circle, then I understand that there's some truth with it, but I'm also trying, always trying to find the document to back it up. Okay, thank you. Plus question from Emily, um, a journalist we have with us um, who's from Hong Kong and, you know, reporting out of Beijing and she's looking at trauma really kind of, you know, journalists when reporting on protests, violence that's in their own home countries and their own places and, and when, the, when the gang or the mob turns, the crowds turn against you, how do you process that kind of and do you feel that there's a trauma attached to this and do you get enough support? Um, yeah, so we had a situation um, a couple of months ago where a stringer that I that I use, you know, he 
um, was one of the journalists that was attacked um, in a situation that was at the hands of the police when they started firing tear gas. And I was very concerned about, you know, about his safety, um, you know, and about that support. Um, I've had where I had a cop actually almost try to body slam me. Um, and that instance actually went straight to the police chief, um, you know, who met well, but it was a very machismo thing he did was he called to, you know, talk to my driver to ask my driver, where was he and why did he let me be in harm's way? Like, really? Are you serious? So, um, you know, so, <laughs> but, you know, my, my, the, the Herald has been very good about trying to get us support when we've had to cover, you know, their natural disasters um, or things like this. But, you know, every reporter has their, their way of processing things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know they want, they constantly wanted me to go to a counselor after um, the earthquake. I kept saying, oh, I'm Haitian. I don't do psychiatrists. <laughs> you know, so the Haitians always say, but I will tell you that my PTSD is that I just cannot, you know, for funerals where I know people, um, I can't see somebody in a coffin. I, you know, I've seen so much death and, 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 you know, I, I still remember, you know, this pile that looked like a, a heap of trash and it literally was bodies on stack of bodies, you know, after, after the quake. Um, and, you know, you, you develop a way of sort of, you're seeing it, but you're not seeing it kind of vision, mm -hmm. but it, it, so in, in the side of yeah. your eye. Yeah. So you, but, but I would tell every reporter that, you know, if you feel that you just can't, or that it's getting to you, then you have to stop. You you have to tell your 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 editors um, that you need to break. We we had a collapse of a building, Surfside condo, in my newsroom, and I was the only reporter not pulled into that story. And I kind of felt bad, right? I'm like, everybody's got pulled into this huge story. Nobody's calling me. But I also realized that somebody in my newsroom was thinking about me and thinking about the fact that I've been I've had to cover so many disasters you know, on my own and that this was one disaster they didn't need to put me in. And who knew that a month later I was gonna have to be covering an earthquake uh, where entire towns basically had, had, had been destroyed, you know? But if I had said at that moment, you know what, I don't think I can do this, you know, they would, that's, uh, they would understand. And you, and you have to put your foot down because if you go into a situation where you're just gonna collapse and you can't, you're no good to yourself, you're no good to your organization. Right. And you you are you're right that you're lucky that you've got editors that clock that. Yeah. And give you the give you the time. You you spent 18 months in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. Um can you tell me a little bit about the you know getting access in that crisis situation? You know, how did you get access? Again, we had journalists from Mexico who joined us on the fellowship program just after the Mexican earthquake, truly traumatized by how the relationship between the media and the earthquake survivors changed, partly because of some very bad journalism by international so, organizations. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting when you talked about parachute journalism, you know, that to me is a clear example of what happened. So I went into Haiti. Um, I kept trying, I had the president's number, President Randy Preval's cell phone number, and I never used it. And I knew that the day that I was going to use that number, I, that would be my last time using it because he, it would have to be something big and he would probably be pissed that I had got him. And it turned out to be the earthquake. And I was trying to get him, trying to call him, trying to call him. And, it, and when I finally got him, I was supposed to leave on a flight at 3 a.m. in the morning, but the pilot would not leave until they got permission from the government that they can land. And I got him, I think maybe like at nine o'clock. And he literally was stepping over dead bodies in the parliament of lawmakers. And he was like, where are you? When are you coming? And I said, as soon as you give me permission. And he says, you have permission. And so he says, the country's destroyed. And so I broke that story. Um, we got on a plane, we landed in Haiti, and I literally walked into the entire Haitian government at the airport. Other reporters who had never been to Haiti showed up and they all went to the palace which had basically collapsed. So people started writing these stories about how the government was, um, you, know, dis you know, distant, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't get in touch with the government, they were missing in action. And that was far from the case. This president was more talkative and open and involved than he had ever been in his in his presidential tenure, and I and I've been covering him, and, and and but that other narrative developed in the press because the foreign press parked themselves at the international airport. So when when Hillary Clinton came, I will never forget this. Hillary Clinton came, and she was at the international airport. 
And it was all international media that was there. And the Haitian media was at the police station where the government had set up. And they literally had to go over to the police station and drive journalists. It's all the same tarmac, but had to drive the, the, the journalists there to cover the, the Hillary Clinton press conference. But when the government was having press conference, it was basically just Haitian media and myself that was over there at that press conference. So this is how, you know, you know, these narratives and these stories get framed. But because I was there, because I had been covering him, I got access. I did a profile on how he, I knew that every day this president took a nap at four o'clock in the afternoon. The earthquake was at 444. And the reason why he survived the earthquake that day was because of pantyhose. His wife had to go to an event and she looked out at her legs and decided she needed to put on a pair of pantyhose. And she says, you know what, Renee, let's go up to the house. Um, and when she pulled into the yard of the house, that's when the quake happened and the house collapsed right in front of them. And his grandchildren had been inside and they had managed to run out just, you know, just in time, you know? So it was, you know, and that was a story I got because I knew his routine. I, even though he was somebody that doesn't like to be in the media spotlight, you know, I'm using all of this. And at some point he invited me in to, you know, to these meetings that he was having with the international community. You know, I saw what he was asking for the tents and how the U.S. was sort of laughing and didn't want to do the tents. So that kind of access gives you a different perspective. And oftentimes people say, oh, you're just, you know, supporting this person. You're just advocating. No, I have a different viewpoint than you because I have a particularly different kind of access than you. Um, I will say also in terms of the quake victims and individuals, I mean, one of the benefits that I bring to the table is because I speak Creole, I speak the language, I understand the culture, I'm half Haitian, you know, and, 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 and people appreciate that, you know, regular Haitians, you know, will criticize by Creole because it's with an accent and it's heavy and at times or whatever, but the, the man on the street, they appreciate the fact that even though I'm, I'm, I'm living over there, that I continue to hold on to the language in the culture and I'm able to to relate to them, you know, in a certain way. And so they open, they they will eventually opening up. But Haitians are like the original Maroons. They don't talk much. So in order for you to really get somebody to bring their guard down, it requires you to spend time and to get their confidence and their trust. And and, and that's where you get those stories, you know, but you as a reporter, you also have to balance it up and have people understand that, you know, um, you're not going to change your life. You can't pay them for the story. And I tell everybody I, I talk to, I say, listen, I'm not going to make you any promises that the story is going to change your life. It may not. But if people don't know your story, if they don't know your struggle, they can't do anything for you. And that's the only reason why I want you to share it with me. Thank you. That's um, that's really beautiful. Thank you. And you've made that point before on on, on yeah. kind of talking about your work on on cancer reporting. Can I ask you um one last question? We're running out of time, and I could talk for hours about migration. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, there's been a lot of migration out of Haiti. Um, what are the main routes and refuge um, destinations for refugees, and how are you how are you how are you keeping on top of this story in particular, and how much are you kind of following them? So again, you know, oh, as people, readers and as kind of yeah. reporting. So a lot of readers and a lot of um, reporters were shocked, right? When we had 15,000 migrants show up at the border of Del Rio, Texas and um, La Ciudad Acuña in Mexico, yeah. you know, last month. And there was a, some, a lot of assumptions were made. People were making this assumption that these were people who were coming to the United States because of the assassination of the president on the 7th of July and then the 14th August earthquake. But because we had been ahead of the story at the Miami Herald, uh, we knew that this was not the case. So when I say ahead of the story, um, from after 2010, everybody was waiting for a migration crisis out of Haiti and it didn't happen. But then there was all this promise of billions of dollars in aid. And then two, three years after when the aid didn't realize, we started to see a trend. Haitians started going to Brazil. They were dying in the Amazon because traffickers were bringing them in. And then the Brazilian government stepped up, started to give them permanent residency because Brazil needed workers because they were getting to go into the World Cup and the Olympics. As Haitians started to go to Brazil, we started seeing that because of the Portuguese, at some point, um, the, the games were over, the economy started changing, Brazil started having this corruption issue. We saw a different migration going into Chile. 
when I would go to Haiti, I would see the airports just crowded with people, like literally like hundreds, over a thousand people at the airport. And I started asking them what's going on. And I realized, oh no, these are people who are trying to go to Chile. And then I would go to a Brazilian embassy and I see these long lines of people trying to get these, these passports to go to these visas to go to Brazil. So in 2016, during the Obama administration, that's when we had the first migration crisis. You had hundreds of Haitians show up at the US-Mexico border in Tijuana. And then the US in response basically lifted a six year ban on deportations to Haiti and people started, and they started sending people back. The following year, I actually went to Chile and I did a whole series where I interviewed Haitians who were living in Chile about life in Chile. And I, and I documented the fact that in one year, um, Haiti lost 1% of its population over 100,000 people to Chile. So when this crisis happened the other day, I knew that these were people that were coming up from, from Brazil and Chile because I had written about that 7,000 mile Darien Gap is a very, is one of the world's most dangerous migration tracks. So we were able to put that story into perspective, right? And then, and it became, what are the root causes of this? Why are people all of a sudden showing up um, there at the, you know, at the border? So we told that story. Now we're seeing the people returning um, and then that's how, and so that's what we're doing, continuing to follow those stories. And the migration is a story of Haiti. And at the same time, I've reported a story about how, you know, it's not Haitian migration isn't just a U.S. problem, but it's a Latin America problem because we're seeing Haitians show up in places that traditionally you did not have Haitians. And at the same time, because of this earthquake, we're seeing traffickers basically convincing people to get onto boats and instead of ending up in the U.S. to ending up in Cuba or they're ending up in the Southern Bahamas. So that's how, you know, but that's, again, having covered a story and, and, and been with it, that you're able to recognize the trend and you can do those smart stories that advances the conversation rather than to, like, get it wrong. And do you, um, what relationship do you have with these communities that are on the move? Do you have people that you speak to regularly and do you and do you find that you know do they read your stories when they when they can? Yeah, well, one of them wrote my story. He was not happy at all, right? Because oftentimes people will decide to talk to you and they don't know how it's going to all flush out. And I remember this young man who was in Chile and wanted a job, and when, and I sent him the story, and he wasn't happy at all, uh, you know, about it. Um, but yeah, there are people that I continue to, to keep in touch with. There's actually a professor who in Miami that I deal with on other issues. And it turned out that he has a whole project in respect to the migration. And he actually has a WhatsApp group where he is in contact with people who are, who are currently making that track, um, through Latin America. So, you know, so that's what it is. It's about sourcing. We didn't talk about that, but you know, so much is it for me is just sourcing and having the sources who are in different places and, and, and the relationship with them for them to just keep you informed when things you know are happening, when things are moving, um, and, and and basically using them as entry points, you know, into stories. Okay, thank you. And um, I know you don't like kind of dividing Haiti or any journalism into good news stories and bad news <laughs> stories. Um, but like I said at the very beginning, you have been really good at reminding us always that Haitians. Uh, and painting the picture of Haiti, so it's not a story of victims who things are just happening to you. You've always given them the kind of agency, their identity, partly because you understand their culture. Where are those stories? What, what, you know, where are those stories at the moment? Do you think the story is kind of hope in a way? You know, it, it's like you know, sometimes as a journalist, you just feel like a rat running on a treadmill, right? So I can tell you, like the earthquake. Um, when I was in Lake Kai and I was doing the story and, and literally it was like every town I went to, I thought, oh my God, this is bad. And then I went to the next town and it was worse. And then it was worse. So I was on a one week where honestly, every story was just a depressing story. And I did say to myself, I, then I went to this one town where the whole narrative was different. We are going to rebuild. You know, our motto is we are a little special place. And then they started talking to me and this was a family where they had just lost their uncle and their aunt who had just had the building collapse on them, saving their teenage daughter, you know? Um, and yet they were, they were full of this optimism. And then I went to this college that is run by these priests and everything was destroyed. And yet, you know, he says, you know, it was almost like, you know, we're, we're not dead. We still are alive. We still have life in us, right? And I just remember, oh my God, you know, I have to do this story. It's an uplifting story. Can I just tell you that it took the longest to write that story? Yeah. Because, because one, it's not one of those quick hits, you know, 
police blotter reports, who, what, where, when, and how, right? And then I also wanted to do that story justice and to put it into some sort of perspective and say, yes, this has happened. This is the worst thing that has happened to these people. But there's a spirit of optimism and there's hope here. And, and, but, but those, those stories take time because often you're often chasing the bad news that just doesn't stop. And, 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 and so sometimes you have to put a stop on yourself and say, you know what, today I'm going to write this story. This is, this is a different story and, and, and it shows a different perspective. So, you know, those stories are out there and, and, and I just tell the country, could you just slow down <laughs> some, so, you know, so I can write those stories. I want to write those stories. Um, you know, they're beautiful stories and, and, and they are part of that narrative and part of the fabric, but we just need the time because we are in the news business. And when I'm constantly chasing the news, it's hard to do those other stories that are not so obvious. They aren't, but they are worth doing. And thank you so much. Um, for writing those stories for take, and I do hope you get time to both rest and to <laughs> um, to do um, the kind of long form stories, but also crucially that, that you get every opportunity to carry on doing the amazingly important reporting you are doing. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us. It's been a real, real eye opener and real well, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you. And next All week right. we're going to speak about journalism in exile um, in Nicaragua which is another okay. country where, you know, it's not easy to get the story out. Jacqueline, thank you so much and best of luck to you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.